on camera. Today's January 30th, 2017. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center. And with me today is uh, Mr. Ed Wood, who is also a volunteer at the History Center. Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center. And we're pleased to have Mr. Michael Schwartz, who is a consultant, uh, come in and join us today to, to see what we do and how we conduct these interviews and offer us any, any advice that, that would help us. So we appreciate you being here, Mr. Schwartz. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Don Cowan. Uh, Mr. Cowan is a Marine veteran and he's agreed to come in and talk to us about his life and his military history. Uh, this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project and we're really honored to have you Mr. Cowan and thanks for coming in. Thank you. Would you give us your full name and your current address? Okay, name is <clears throat> excuse me, Donald Robert Cowan. And where and when were you born? I was born September 11th, 1947 in New York. Uh, we lived in New York, uh, Valley Stream, Peekskill, New York. And then in the uh, summer of 1955, my family moved to Georgia. My father was from Georgia. So uh, the culture shock was quite a bit. We used to go into New York City at Christmas time, go to Macy's or Gimbel, sit on Santa's lap. And then in 1955, we moved to Macon, Georgia, where children didn't wear shoes every day. The restrooms in drinking fountains had whites only signs on them mm -hmm. and they thought I had a funny accent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, went to grammar school, Catholic school, uh, St. Joseph's School in Macon, went to high school in Macon, uh, graduated from high school, wasted my parents money in two years of my time at Georgia Southern. Um, to say I attended Georgia Southern would be a stretch. I was enrolled. <laughs> so uh, after that uh, I knew I was going to be drafted. Um, when it, it went up through the draft physical and so forth. I didn't hear anything from the Air Force. I think I got a letter from the Army. I got a call from the Navy. But the Marine recruiters came to my house one evening and they had a large book of all the specialties they could have. And they were going through all the things they could do, OCS and this and that and the other thing. And they happened to flip the page open and one of the recruiters said, now if you enlist for four years, we guarantee to put you in the aviation field. And I thought, well, they protect airplanes. So I went in in April of 68, uh, went to Paris Island, went to Camp Geiger up in North Carolina, uh, <clears throat> got through with that. We were in a holding platoon for a while, uh, waiting to go to uh, Tennessee to go to school. Did a whole lot of various, you know, working in small stores where they sold clothing, mess hall, things like that. Um, went to Millington, Tennessee, uh, for school and we were in another holding pattern there and probably the thing that affected me most in my service happened there in Tennessee because here I was I'd just gone in in April this was August early September I've been in for was that like four or five months and I was now on burial detail I was one of the pallbearers for Marine <sighs> essentially you know for me uh, and it was a lot of times, we, we, I did about six funerals, I think. And you just got, I was the, as a, as a PFC out of Paris Island, I was the ranking person there. So we folded the flag and then I would hand it to the body escort. And we didn't do that slow, deliberate salute back then. We did a very crisp salute. And then you would hear, the, you know, the, the body escort would deal and hand the flag to the family with those words. That had to be a terribly emotional it was, responsibility. You know, that, on behalf of a grateful nation. So, uh, went to avionics school there in Tennessee from September to February. <clears throat> um, from there, I went to Cherry Point, North Carolina. Uh, was there from February till October. Uh, all in, a, I was in a C-130 squadron, BMGR 252. Um, uh, October <clears throat> got the word that I was going to go overseas. Went home on leave. Uh, went out to California. Was over at um, Camp Pendleton, marching up and down the hills and so forth and so on. Uh, then, then Thanksgiving of '69, left California. 
we flew over. We had a 45-minute stop in Hawaii, which was kind of funny because all the officers and senior NCOs got off the plane and went to all the bars in the airport to make sure nobody went in the bars. And then we all got back on the plane. We landed in Okinawa. Literally, I could see the planes I was going to work on, the C-130s, but no, 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 no. I had to fly to Japan overnight so they could go, yes, you're going to be stationed in Okinawa. <laughs> Went to Okinawa and was there essentially all the same day. It was Thanksgiving Day. Uh, was there in Okinawa in the C-130 squadron, Ichigoni, we were called, 152. Ichigoni is Japanese for 152. So I was there December, January, February. I uh, went to school in the Philippines supposedly for a week to learn a piece of crypto gear. Uh, we got there. The gunnery sergeant in our shop was the person with me. <clears throat> we got to the Philippines, and we you know, went down to the shop one day to go. We were here for school, and the Navy said, well, we didn't get any classified confidential orders that you were coming here, so we don't know you're supposed to be here. So the gunny and I hung out in the Philippines for a couple of weeks doing much of nothing. <laughs> I was in a shack up in the jungle, and that was about it. But the funny thing was uh, one morning I woke up, and I heard some voices that I thought I recognized, and sure enough, it was a guy I'd been in Cherry Point with who was stationed in Japan who had come to the Philippines to go to a different school. So it was one of those sort of, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Reunion kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> spent most of the month of February in the Philippines, went back to Okinawa in March, and then April, uh, because we had planes on the ground at Da Nang all the time, we had to have maintenance people there to work on the planes, a small maintenance detachment. And we were called the, the 152nd High Altitude Slave Labor Battalion. I've still got a picture of our squadron insignia that, unfortunately, I can't get out of the album anymore, but it, it looked pretty good. It's a picture of the ruptured duck holding an eight ball and a can of beer. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I was there for about four or five weeks before I came down with hepatitis. Um, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I just knew I didn't want to eat. I was living on Coca-Cola. I was, you know, five, six, seven Coca-Colas a day. I could hold down ice cream if I could get it, Da Nang ice cream. Um, I could hold down fruit cups, those sea ration fruit cups, but you mentioned meat and potatoes. It was like, no thank you. And so finally I went to sick bay and they said, yeah, you got hepatitis. And I thought, uh, okay. The next thing I know, I was at Freedom Hill Hospital for about a week. And if you have hepatitis, that's contagious to other people. Their idea of isolation was, here, here's your food tray, you wash it out yourself. Mm. Well, I didn't feel like eating anyway, so it yeah. didn't really matter. <clears throat> I was there for a few days, <clears throat> excuse me, and then about, uh, I think, three or four days. And then I went down to the Air Force Evac Hospital at Da Nang, uh, spent the night there. The next morning, loaded up a plane, and there were some people with some serious injuries getting on that plane. The plane was due to leave Vietnam and go if I remember correctly, the Philippines, Guam, California, Texas, and then Washington, D.C., all along the way, dropping people off all along the way. I still didn't know what I had other than what hepatitis was or anything about it. But I had an idea it wasn't good when they took me onto the plane on a stretcher, took me to the back of the plane, strapped the stretcher to the, to the wall of the plane. The nurse came by, picked up my records, and went, hmm, put on gloves and a mask, and pulled a curtain around me. I thought, well, this isn't good. <laughs> Um, stopped in the Philippines. I stayed on the plane. We got to Guam. They decided to let me off in Guam. Most of the people that were on the plane getting off in Guam got on a bus. They put me in an ambulance. We drove over to the hospital. And then I got my first taste of uh, Navy life in the hospital. <clears throat> because I was supposed to be in isolation, they put me in the last bed in the ward down by the door. Everybody else was up at the center of the ward where they had fans blowing on them and so forth. I woke up at three the next morning, literally covered in mosquito bites because I didn't have a fan blowing on me. I was just down there at one end of the hall. I started to get into a fight with a Navy corpsman about taking a fan and putting it down there. But you know, uh, So the next morning, went through procedures and went to uh, the ward I was assigned to. And because it was an old ward style hospital, their idea of isolation was, you people live on the sun porch. You have one head that you can use, a head being a bathroom for military terms. You have one head that you can use, or you're on the sun porch. You don't go anywhere else. You don't go to the rec room. You don't do anything else, back and forth. And then, of course, uh, there were some Navy people there, some Marines there. 
the first, I think it was the first Thursday they had field day, that normal Thursday night field day. And the nurse came in and said, you know, you're to clean this area here, clean this area, and then we want you to go clean the rec room. And I looked at her and I said, we're not going to go clean the rec room. We don't get to go in there. We're on isolation. We'll clean this area. We'll clean our head. Thank you very much. And from there, my relationship with nurse just blossomed. <laughs> nurse Wretched, I called her. Uh, so it was pretty much, you know, every morning they stick a thermometer in your mouth. They walk up and down, you know, put a thermometer in it, and they come back, check your thermometer, check your pulse, blah, 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 blah. I remember one morning I fell asleep again after the thermometer in my mouth, and they came by, and my temperature was like 60, and they thought I was dead, and they were shaking me to wake me up again. <laughs> the thermometer had fallen out of my mouth. But uh, once a week, you would go see the doctors. Still, no one told me what hepatitis was, just you have hepatitis. <laughs> and so one morning, I'm, you know, we're standing there in line to go in and see the doctors, and I've got the medical record, and I open it up, and Nurse Wretched says, close that, you don't know what you're reading. Well, okay, fine. <laughs> Went in, and so I was there for about three, four weeks, five weeks or so. <clears throat> I started to eat. I actually started to eat again because I had a dream one night that my mother had made me a turkey sandwich on gummy white bread with cranberry. And the next morning I felt like I wanted to have breakfast. Huh. So I stayed there and you know, my relationship with Nurse Ratchet just blossomed one day after the next. And then finally they decided I was ambulatory. I could go out and do things. So I got Nurse Ratchet had called in a favor and I went downstairs to report to wherever the work was. Now I'm in, I, I stand six feet tall, six foot one. I weighed less than 140 pounds at the time. You know, if you don't eat for five or six weeks, you tend to lose weight. So I looked like somebody still had the coat hanger in the robe, wearing the seersucker pajamas in the robe. So that morning they gave me a trash bag and a stick with a nail in it, and I had me go outside and start picking up trash around the hospital. <laughs> now, I was in the back of the hospital, and I thought, you know, this is an accompanied tour for these Navy people. So I worked my way around to the front of the hospital, pick up the trash, put the stick, <sighs> wipe the sweat off my brow, pick up another piece of trash. So, <sighs> and I guess the captain's wife or somebody saw me and they came running up, what are you doing out here? What are you doing out here? So the next thing I know, I had a desk job. Oh. And where I had a desk job was in, a, place, in a, a section called IPPB, Inverse Positive Pressure Breathing, for people with lung problems. And sure enough, on the desk was a Merck manual. And I got to read about what hepatitis was and what I had, finally. Oh, it's a disease of your liver. Your liver can shrink and expand, shrink and expand, and things like alcohol destroy your liver. Your liver is now permanently damaged with hepatitis, so I no longer drink because I go from sober to puke. What's the point? And a few people, you know, have a relapse of it. It takes you six to eight weeks to get over it, blah, 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 blah. So next time I got my medical record and opened it up and Nurse Ratchet said, you don't know what you're looking at, I rambled off everything I knew about hepatitis. Mm. And then she asked me another question, and I said, I don't know about that, because I don't have that. I have hepatitis. <laughs> uh, stayed there for another week or so, and then I think one of those meetings, the doctor said, yeah, I think another week or two, you'll be fine. Nurse Ratchet said, oh, I think he's ready to go now. <laughs> Thank you, Nurse Ratchet. So I went from there to a holding situation in Guam, flew to Okinawa. Uh, this time I knew what was going on, so when we got to Okinawa, it was, you know, they were pretty much grunt marines getting ready to go through training. I talked to the platoon sergeant who talked to the company commander, who, and I said, I work on planes that are across the other side of the island. <clears throat> they made a few phone calls, and about an hour or two later, a jeep came by to pick me up and take me back to my squadron. So that, by my recollection, that was uh, early summer. I was there for about another few weeks, and I went back to Vietnam. Uh, all my, all my friends had packed up all my stuff for what they didn't want to keep. <laughs> you know, and so I was trying to find where all my, my, my clothes and my baggage went. So I went back to Vietnam. <clears throat> was there for the summer monsoon season. Now, was this 69? Uh, this would be uh, 70. 70. I was there for the, the summer monsoon season. Um, we had a typhoon come, in, come ashore. And one of the things that we did in, in our C-130 squadron was we were an aerial refueler for what they call bar cap runs. And we dropped night flares for combat. So we had a large lean-to on our tarmac, uh, telephone pole, tin roof, that they stored the night flares. Um, typhoon hit, most of our planes took off. They either flew them to Taiwan or they took them over, over the mountains into Thailand. 
uh, those were the closest places they could go without going all the way back to Okinawa. So we're, you know, the monsoon's coming, the rains are flowing, the wind's coming through. And at one point, we were standing in the doorway. We had a hangar at that time, a large hangar, and there were several helicopters that had come down from, I think it was called Monkey Mountain, uh, and they parked their helicopters in our hangar. Uh, so we were sort of guarding their stuff and pilfering it and guarding it and pilfering it as the things go by. Uh, they made the mistake of packing one of their helicopters full of sea rations, so they didn't have those sea rations when they came back to get their helicopter. I don't know what happened to them, I swear I don't. Um, but we were out there watching the storm one day, and we, you know, we had one of those, um, I think they call them connex boxes, packed with sandbags. And it was like a giant hand took the roof off the shed, picked it up, and then slammed it to the ground. And we thought, okay, we need to get back <laughs> inside. Wind churning around like that. So I stayed there for till about November, uh, late November. Went back to Okinawa. I was due to rotate back home. This was November. I'd spent the 12 months. Um, the company clerk, I knew him from Cherry Point. He had been in the um, electronics wing, but because he could type, type, they had him upstairs doing cler clerical work. So I said, I said, hey, Scotty, you know, if you keep me here for a couple more weeks, we'll lose the paperwork, when I get home, I'll be able to spend Christmas and New Year's at home before I go to my next duty station. So I pretty much had free run for a couple of weeks. The gunnery sergeant in charge of the shop just said, make sure you show up you know, sometime each day that we know you're alive. Other than that, you know. Yeah. So I took my savings, you know, and did the typical buy the stereo equipment, get the camera, get the very things like that. Uh, came home to, it was kind of funny. I came home, we, we basically got on the plane in Okinawa with all the other people. This time when we landed in Hawaii for the 45 minute rest stop, they didn't care if you got back on the plane or not. <laughs> it was pretty much, you know, I was like, you go in the bar, do whatever you want. Got to California, and my next duty station was Wigby Island, Washington, a little island off the coast of Seattle. So I had to pay my own way home to Georgia. Uh, got a flight. Now, November in Vietnam is a warm month, shall we say. The plane I got on to go back to Atlanta had a layover in Denver. I got off the plane, it was zero degrees, I got back on the plane. <laughs> Got to Atlanta, spent Christmas, New Year's with my family, and then got back on another plane and headed to Seattle. Now, my order said M-A-R-T-D, M-A-S-T-D, Naval Air Station, Seattle. So I went to Seattle. Got there that evening only to find out that's not where I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be at Wigby Island. Mm. So I spent the night there in Seattle, <clears throat> got on a bus the next day and got out there. And they, you were supposed to be here yesterday. I was here yesterday, but not here yesterday. Um, Went out there, it was a reserve station. Uh, so I had spent three years, almost four years, working on C-130s. Now I was working on C-119s, the old boxcar twin pylon planes. Uh, I was there for about a week or so. They gave me an assignment to go out and work on one of the planes. I was lying on my ground on the runway, and this you know, breeze goes up your pant leg, and it's like, no, this is just not, this is just not right. This is just not right. Well, it was a Navy base, and the Navy was complaining we're supporting you too much. You people don't do anything, blah, 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 blah. So one morning in the shop, they said, is anybody in here bench certified on any of the equipment? Hand went up because I was certified on ARC 84 VHF radios. So I went down to the Navy squadron and had an inside job for the rest of the time I was there. And it worked out pretty well because I got bench certified on several other pieces of equipment. What is bench certified? It means that you're, you can not just take the black box out of the plane. You can open the black box and fix it. So um, I worked on uh, LORAN, uh, Long Range Radio Assisted Navigation Systems. I worked on VHF radios, a um, couple of different sizes of VHF radios. Um, did that until uh, till the end of my enlistment in uh, April of 72. Uh, got married uh, in June of 71. Wife and I had lived in a trailer park there outside of the base. And when we got, uh, when I got discharged, we drove down the coast to California to visit relatives and then across country around the southeast to uh, make into my home up to Virginia to her home. I had been um, admitted to the University of South Florida in Tampa. So we moved to Tampa, Florida. I went to school there in Tampa from 72 to 75, got a 
bachelor's degree in business administration with a major in accounting. My wife was a nurse. She was working at the VA hospital. Um, really didn't have any job, great job prospects when I got out in 75 um, and applied to the state of Georgia and went up and got a job with the state of Georgia and state government. My wife transferred from <clears throat> the VA in Tampa to the VA in Atlanta. And then we started our life here in Atlanta. Uh, worked for the state for 34 years, got a master's degree in public administration from Georgia State, uh, had various financial and administrative jobs with the state, uh, spent six years as a college vice president at one of the two-year technical colleges. What college was that? Uh, Chattahoochee Technical College. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my last job was the budget director for the state labor department. Okay. Yeah. Go down and make budget presentations to the legislature and so oh. forth. I retired in 2008. Um, they asked me to come back. I came back part-time for another four years. Uh, my last assignment with the state was finding a new accounting system for the Department of Labor. And I searched, uh, it was very technical stuff in terms of how you get money from the federal government to your state governments for labor enterprises. You have ES, Employment Services, and you have UI, Unemployment Insurance. And there's a very complicated formula for UI that deals with time factors, how much time you spend doing a particular uh, unemployment insurance claim, whether it's a non-monetary, et cetera, et cetera. So finding an accounting system that took care of all that time and how much time you spent on each claim was kind of difficult. I uh, did a lot of research. All the states had to be doing the same thing, what states were using. And when I finally told them how much it was going to cost to get a new system, they said, thank you. And that was the end of my employment <laughs> with the state. It was going to cost them a lot. They've since found out that they could use the same system for the Department of Labor, for the Department of Juvenile Justice and some others, so they split the cost. But huh. that was it. So I've been retired fully since 2012. I'm a part-time golfer, a full-time house husband, cook, dishwasher. And that is pretty much it. We have three children. Uh, one is married to a doctor. They live out in Colo uh, Colorado. The other two I can't get out of the house. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm going to have to sell the house out from under them and, you know, they can talk to the new buyers when they want to rent and so forth. And that's pretty much been it. Let me back up. Mm -hmm. uh, when you went into the military, went to the Marines, and you found out you were going to Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, that was a period where there were a lot of protests and a lot of controversy about being in Vietnam. Did, did you ever have any problems with individuals and when you were in uniform here in the states well, because there were a lot there was no, some I, I really, you know I really didn't uh, I didn't get any you know in the airport we, we had to travel at that time we had to travel in a, in a dress uniform so yeah. I didn't have you know didn't have people poke at you in the airport it was you know pretty much neglect you know they sort of hmm. yeah. that was pretty much it and okay. you know home in uniform yeah. family was happy to see you I remember the when I first got home we sat down at dinner one night, and we lived down, literally lived downtown in Macon. And the siren went off for the fire truck, and I almost jumped up from the dinner table to, yeah. just because when sirens went off, you went to the, you know, you went to the bunker. It was like, yeah. okay, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm here. I can <laughs> have another glass of tea. And that was good. <laughs> but no, even going back and forth across country, it was. Okay. Now, the odd thing was, um, there in Washington, Woodby Island. We would go into, my wife and, and I, and then one of my buddies there, the four of us, he and his wife, we would go into Seattle. And, you know, we had short hair, military haircuts. <coughs> Excuse me. And around the colleges there around Seattle, it was like, you know, we, we don't want to talk to you. We don't want to do anything to you. Mm -hmm. But we would go up into Vancouver, British Columbia. Oh, hey, how you doing? Come on in. Huh. It, was, it was a very different, you know, it, it was, you know, it's not like we were in uniform when yeah. we went into town. We were in civilian clothes. But it was just that whole mix of if you're short hair, you can't be. Uh, but in, up in Canada, it was like, wasn't it? That's issue. interesting. It was, yeah. it was kind, of, kind of an odd feeling. Yeah. When you first went to Vietnam and you landed, mm -hmm. as you got off the plane, what was your first impression? What were your thoughts as you just looked, around, looked at the surroundings? And you know, it... it it was kind of, you know, I wanted to go down there and see what was going on with the planes, work on, you know, it was pretty much, I just wanted to work on the planes and, and do that. Uh, I, I could see where Marble Mountain was. Uh -huh. I knew the, the north of us was Monkey Mountain. It was an Air Force base. The odd thing was we were on the, what would be the, 
get my directions here, we would have been on the west side of the runways, two 10,000-foot runways running north and south, and we would have been on the west side of it. Uh, at the very north end was a Marine Air Group, MAG, MAG, and I don't know if it was MAG 32, MAG 36, but it was a, you know, we were not part of that MAG group. We were, we were the, the interlopers, if you will. We were just the C-130 squadron. We weren't really stationed there. We were stationed in Okinawa, but we were on planes on the ground. Oh. Um, we had a fuel farm not just outside of where our living quarters were, big rubber bladders buried in the ground. You could look across the runways, and you could see the Air Force set up over there with window units hanging out of the air, con you know, air con window <laughs> air conditioning units hanging out of that. And we were lucky to have a fan. You know, so it was, it was that odd kind of like, okay, I should have joined the Air Force. <laughs> but it was, it was kind of funny. If you, you had, um, if I remember correctly, you had a PX card. There were certain things you could and couldn't buy. So we were always scouring the PX for refrigerators or fans, because if you had a refrigerator or a fan, you were golden. Um, and of course, when you rotated back out again, your fan and refrigerator went up for auction to the highest bidder. Because if you had a fan, you turned the fan, you plugged it in, you turned it on, and you didn't turn it off. It just stayed on all the time, and it blew across your bunk, because if not, the mosquito net didn't do a damn thing for you. You were eating alive. So, and it was a funny instance, uh, when we were getting ready to leave, I auctioned my stuff off, and a couple of guys were like, "Oh no, we're not going to auction. We're not going to. We're not going to bid. You can't take it with you. you. Can't take it with you." And this other guy just took a can of lighter fluid and squirted it into the fan and set it on fire right in front of him and said, "Okay, now nobody gets it." <laughs> and then the next thing you know, it was like, "I could have bought it. I could have bought it." Um, that was pretty much it. You know, you had you had the U.S. The, I call them U.S.O. shows. You had the the various shows come in, go out, come in, go out. Um, at one point, they moved our squadron. We were down at the south end of the, e we were south and east end of the runway, and they moved us up to the center, what I think they call it the 15th aerial port, was where the commercial planes came in and landed. Um, and then we had a hangar there, but uh, it's kind of like put us right in the line of fire for mortar rounds, things like that coming out the, uh, from the hills. I did get shot at once. Uh, Buddy and I, we got up that morning they took us to the mess hall, we came back, and it was kind of an odd thing. We couldn't go to the Air Force mess hall because we weren't Air Force. We went to the MAG mess hall, but we weren't part of the MAG group. So we either had to be the first ones in or the last ones into the mess hall. And if we were the last ones into the mess hall, you know, the moldy fruit at the bottom of the bin was pretty much yours or anything like that. But uh, we'd gone to Chow, gone back to the, to the barracks or to our hooch, and we started to walk up the road. And uh, there was a large, white wooden fence uh, outlined our tarmac. And so we're walking up the road, like that, and the next thing you hear this, ee, spam, ee, spam, and two bullets hit the fence. And it was like, <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> and you're sort of like, okay, do we lay here on the ground and wait? Do we get up and run? <laughs> do you hear anything else? And I guess, you know, a sniper decided here with two guys walking yeah. down the street. Uh, we told everyone, no, no, it didn't happen to you. And we, well, what are those holes in the fence? Ah, uh, those been there for, okay, fine, fine. If you don't think we were shot at, fine, I, we don't care. <laughs> well, you were in an area that was targeted quite often, weren't you, the rockets? And yeah, that? you could, you, you know, it was sort of, the, sometimes the sirens went off and then you heard the explosion and sometimes you heard the explosion and then the sirens went off. But I guess we were just not a targeted area or something because, yeah. you know, now I think, I. By my recollection, when I got to Whidbey Allen, Washington, I got there in January, so sometime between January and, say, March, I seem to recall watching a news flash where they had dropped around in it, hit, near hit one of our planes or hit, because now that we had moved from, from the southeast end to the center, if you could take out the center of the runway, you pretty much stopped air traffic, and mm -hmm. one of our planes or something around it got hit somewhere around there, but I, I never did get it to verify all that. Now, I noted on your information form that you did suffer some injury. What, what exactly was that? No, uh, the, only, the only thing I got was, the only thing was hepatitis and loss of hearing. Yeah, but the hearing is considered yeah, service related to, injury. Yeah, I've got to go back now that if I don't hear women's voices worth a toot, I just yeah. thought that's my excuse for my wife. <laughs> that, but I mean, when I take the hearing test, you see the, the low end and then you get to the high end and the thing just yeah. drops right off like that. I don't know, I can't hear children very well, I can't hear women very well, high-pitched voices, I don't hear them with a toot anymore. 
is that the result of you being around the aircraft so much? And all no, the time. Not I enough mean, air protection? Just, yeah, no, no air protection whatsoever, just always around high jet noise. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say you worked around the planes. It's another thing to realize you lived and worked around the planes yeah. all the time. Did you ever get a chance to go into Da Nang and meet any people or see? We, um, we were pretty much restricted. Now, we did one day... Um, the guy was in charge of the whole maintenance group. He was a staff sergeant, no, a gunnery sergeant. He was in charge of the whole maintenance group. He tried to get us all together to go to the beach over at Da Nang, and we literally went through Da Nang City. But other than sort of just a, a run through Da Nang City, that was it. Uh, we would go up to Freedom Hill, where, the, where Bob Hope would have the USO shows, because it was a large PX up that way. And to go from Da Nang, from our air base to Freedom Hill, you went, you went outside the base and you went to a place we called Dog Patch, which was just a two-lane road with, on one side, uh, agriculture, rice paddies, things like that. On the other side, literally wooden, large wooden crates that people lived in. You know, like a, you know, an eight by eight wooden crate that had a piece of fabric for a door. Um, you know, you sort of saw how the, the other half, if you will, that, how people in the most dire straits in that war zone were just living hand to mouth over there. Yeah. Um, that was kind of odd. And then another odd thing was the Air Force didn't have any C-130 maintenance people on the ground at Da Nang. They didn't have any C-130s there. But they could get parts, but they had no one to work on the planes. So occasionally they would call us to come over and fix something on one of their planes to get things going. I remember one time I went over to work on a piece of gear and the plane was full of Vietnamese civilians. Now, they didn't have the bench seats or anything pulled down. They were just literally in the belly of the plane, just, you know, sit on the floor. Um, I got there to work on the plane, and they made everybody get off the plane. Now, this is, you know, this is summertime, Da Nang. And there was this one lady there with a few-month-old infant. And all these people were off the plane. Now, they weren't in my way. I could have worked around them on the plane. And this lady's standing out there in the sun with an infant, in, and I thought, couldn't you have gotten some shade for these people? Couldn't they stand under the wings of the plane or something? And why, why do you decide that these people just don't deserve to have any treatment whatsoever? Just get out of the way. Now get back on the plane yeah. like herded cattle. Get on the plane and go. It just, just didn't see, something about it just didn't seem to yeah. fit with what we were trying to do. Where were they being transported? Do that imagine? I don't know. Huh. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. I, I'm very familiar with the area you were in. Mm -hmm. Through Dog Patch, first camp on left was Camp Hoover, which was just before Freedom Hill, yeah. which was a CB camp. Yeah. And then you went up the road a little bit, and there was a PX. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the revetments on the airstrip, we built those mm -hmm. for the Marine fighter jets yeah. and helicopters. My battalion, what the CB battalion built those. Did you... It any, I mean, I was there for nine months. Mm -hmm. so I made the trip many times, to, many times, probably twice to China Beach. So I know, yeah. I know the route. Uh, I'm not familiar where, where your camp was exactly. I did do a lot of work on the airstrip. In fact, I was so amazed we had to use the Air Force facilities and they had flushing commodes. That blew my mind. <laughs> uh, but did, did what was your... What was your camp like at the airstrip? Uh, if you came from Freedom Hill, came through Dog Patch, came to the gate, mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember how many roads you came in past, but eventually when you started going toward the airstrip, if you took a hard right when you got to the airstrip and down the line, that's where we were. Uh, we didn't have flushable toilets. We had hooches that were maybe a little larger than the size, size of this room. We had six guys to a hooch, one in each corner and one in the middle on either side. You had a small, oh, maybe waist-high, chest-high wall next to your bunk that separated you from the other people there. Um, because we were so close to the 15th aerial port, when you got up there, where they had flushable toilets and all kinds of good stuff up there. So, <laughs> I'm interested. You, you mentioned earlier uh, that your C-130s are. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. That y'all dropped flares. They did night flare did drops, do, yeah. Did you do these mission operations? No. Or was it just, okay. No, I was not an air crew member. Okay. Uh, I did train to be an air crew. I went through basic air crew member training because when they find out you're going to be in the air wing when you were in Tennessee, there's always a possibility you could be 
a gunner on a helicopter, anything like that. So the, they go through the drown proofing, they call it, where they put you in a parachute harness, you climb a tower, they put you in a parachute harness, they swing you out over the pool, they drop you in the pool, cross your arms, cross your legs so you don't split yourself apart, hit in the water, swim over to the life raft, get in it, oh, enemy planes are coming, turn the life raft over, get underneath it, turn it back over, get in it, swim the length of the pool, things like that. Just basic, you know, stuff like that. I didn't, naturally, I didn't have to go through the blindfold at night in the, you know, submerge which way is up, but basically, if you're in the water, you let a few blobs out. You, if your air bubbles go to the top, you don't automatically shoot to the top. You put your hand up because you might hit a roof or something. And, you know, basic training for if you hit the water. And the funny thing was when they reminded you that as soon as you hit the water, you're part of the food chain. <laughs> and you're not at the top of the food chain. Um, one of the more interesting, I, I don't say it was interesting, one of the more striking things I think that happened when I was at Da Nang, you got used to planes... All, I mean, all sorts of jets, A4s, A6s, F4s, back and forth. And we were there one day, you, you, you wait for anything, you know, you, you're bored to death until the planes come in to have any work done on them. You jump on the plane as fast as you can because the plane had air conditioning, so you try to get on, close all the doors and do all your work, and then everybody got off the plane at the same time. Don't go in and out, in and out, open the door. But uh, we're hanging around there at our maintenance sheds, and you hear the plane, you know, and you knew something was wrong. And this plane crashed. It was an AD-4, which is a single-engine prop. Um, wings meet under the belly of the plane. It crashed between the two runways. And I don't know if he saw off a napalm round or whatever he had, but the plane slid and caught on fire and slid sideways. And we were maybe 50 yards or so from it. Um, the EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Jeep, came running down, flying down the runway, circled the plane, and took off. And I don't know if they got the pilot out. We couldn't tell. And the plane just sat there burning. And I'm thinking, yo, <laughs> yo. <laughs> we watched the plane burn and burn and burn. Well, finally, the MAG, a, a Marine ground, you know, firefighters, their truck comes up. They start to foam the plane. They run out of water so they can't foam the plane anymore. And this one Marine gets out in his asbestos suit with a handheld fire extinguisher. They've just about put all the flames out. He gets underneath the plane like this, where the wings meet with a handheld extinguisher putting the flames out, when the EOD people ordered them away from the plane. And they came back over to us and fellow Marines and they were you know, cussing and fuming, chicken shit, people can't even put out a fire on a plane, so forth like that. And the plane sat there and smoldered and smoldered for a while and then it blew up and not, you know, huge explosion like this. It just sort of boom, and dropped into pieces like that. Now the Air Force fire truck comes and they start foaming from like 40 yards out, inching their way closer and closer and closer to this now smoldering nothing. <laughs> and we thought, the guy in the asbestos suit, I want him on my crash crew yeah. next time I fly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, you know, you just sort of, okay, that's the way they do it here. <laughs> so You never did find out what happened to the pilot. <laughs> never did find out what happened to the pilot. Never did, and you know, we just you know you just sort of, it's sort of surreal in a way. You know, you know you're in a war zone. You know things happen. You saw it, and you just sort of, I don't believe it happened. I don't. I just don't believe that thing. It's not like the. It's certainly not like the movies. <laughs> did you ever go back to Vietnam as a civilian? I've never been back to Vietnam. Didn't have haven't gone back to Paris Island. Yeah. Um, Every, you know, I see fellow Marines every once in a while, and I think I had, a, I had a great Christmas about two years ago. I was I had gone to a UPS store over at uh, off of Decatur Road, and was there to send a package to my son and grandson. And several people in line, you know, sort of circled halfway around the store. And when I looked, there was um, a black gentleman over there wearing a fairly well-worn. Uh, field jacket had a big Marine Corps emblem on it, and so forth like that. So I, you know, sort of across the room from a Semper Fi Marine. How you doing? Had a Semper Fi back. I said, "What did you do in the Corps?" He said, uh, "He was a mortarman." I said, "Oh, a ground pounding Marine." You know, asked him if he'd been to Vietnam, and we sort of conversed back and forth around the crowd. Um, got up there and dropped my packages off, and started coming back by. And now he had worked his way around the other side like that. And he stopped me on the way out and he said, thank you, I really appreciate it being recognized. Wow. And I said, it's what Marines do, we look out yeah. for each other. Well, that had to make you feel good. 
And uh, he said, Merry Christmas. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. I, I think we just did. Yeah, that, that's a great story. That's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Marines have a special fraternity, I think. Don't they? Yeah, I think if you've, uh, it was funny. I'd, go, I'd, I'd um, <clears throat> go up to South Carolina and uh, work as a walking scorer for the web.com tour. My brother got me yeah. started in that. And this last year, uh, on the 18th hole, they had a couple of Marines tending the flag because they had yeah. an American flag for the stick. So I went up and, you know, said, Semper Fi to these two guys. And I said, what, just to, ch just to hassle them, I said, what's your first general order? I was like, oh, I was like, I said, oh, you people must have been a San Diego Marine. You were a Curtis Island Marine if you don't remember your first general order. Jeez. <laughs> so you have to, you know, one of those Marine things you have to do. <laughs> hey, one more question. What was your rank when you were in Vietnam? We never I, was, uh, I was a corporal in Vietnam. Uh, I made sergeant uh, when I was in Whidbey Island. Okay. Yeah, I, had, I was never a private. It was kind of funny. I was never a private in the Marine Corps because huh. I'd gone through Paris Island and for whatever reason, they decided to get, make me a PFC. You know, one of the, one of the, you got four or five people always graduated as PFCs. And the morning we were all to graduation, you know, you were getting dressed and so forth and they're all blah, 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 do this, do that and the other thing. And one of the things was in your left shirt pocket, you were supposed to have your ID, cal ID card. Well, when they handed out the envelope to get everybody dressed, I said, I don't have an ID card. And they went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I stayed there polishing people's shoes and straightening ties and got through. They said, you know, clean. They said, you know, do you have a headache this morning? I said, no. You know, the drill instructor was, you know, got to find some way to keep you out of. And I said, no, I have a bad case of athlete's foot. He goes, fine, you're going to sick bay. So I stayed there and everybody else left. I cleaned up the squad bay, went down to sick bay, <laughs> came back, didn't go to inspection. Didn't get my, my picture taken with the company picture. And graduation morning, they had to take me to get a new ID card. And my first ID card was a PFC. I never had an ID card as a private. <laughs> That's pretty unique. Yeah. <laughs> Does I anybody to, have any? Oh, excuse me. I did go to school and uh, while I was there at Cherry Point, they did send me to Patuxent River, Maryland. Uh, that's where I got my first certification on working to, uh, as a bench certification for the radio. And the funny thing was I had to fix the bench radio for them to teach us how to fix the bench radio. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any experience before going into the Marines and doing what you ended up doing in, with the Marines? My father was a, back in the day, was a TV repairman. Huh. So, you know, he, you know, you, so, you know, if, if the old adage goes, if your father was uh, an auto mechanic, your car was the worst one on the block. <laughs> so we never had a TV that worked. Because, that's, you know, when you think about it, I don't want to work on TVs because that's what I do all day. Yeah. I mean, but no, and I mean, no formal training in electronics. I mean, I understood it basically, but that was about it. Yeah. But when you got out, you had some pretty good training. When I got out, I worked part time repairing stereo equipment. Oh. Uh, did that for a while. When I didn't get a job right out of college, I came back to Macon and worked. I was the assistant radio engineer for the city, repairing all the police and fire department oh. radios, huh. which was kind of nice because you got to know all the policemen, yeah. <laughs> which was kind of yeah. nice. That, got some benefits. <laughs> got some benefits from that. I learned a little bit more about uh, that, learned about repeater systems and oh. so forth like that. Oh. Oh. Uh, so that was, that was interesting. But yeah. then after, after, I got a, after I got a job with the state of Georgia, I didn't do any electronics anymore after that. Oh. Do you stay in touch or in contact with any of the people you were with? I haven't seen, I haven't seen any of the people I was stationed with. Uh, I have, uh, got a wedding invitation from one of the guys years later. It was sent, he sent it to my parents' address. My mother saw it, sent him a check and said, you know, thanks and so forth like that. But have never really met back up with anyone uh, that I ever served with, which is, you know, it's a smaller group, you know, even with our group. Yeah. There are very few Marines in our group. Yeah, that's right. You know, the, the majority of the people are Army. And then I guess the next would be Air Force and Navy kind of, but the Marines yeah. is yeah. just a smaller and smaller group of them. Yeah. Um, when we went to the dedication of the wall out there, and, um, or not the dedication, but the, uh, <clears throat> the visiting wall right. of Woodstock yeah. uh, a few months back, um, talked to some of the people who were in the Marine Corps League. And when you look at a map, DeKalb County is the only county in Metro Atlanta that does not have a Marine Corps League detachment. Huh. All the other counties around you do have one. I tell you what, for us not having that many Marines in our outfit, y'all made more noise than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> does anybody have any 
questions? Other, other than dog pasture or going to Freedom Hill mm -hmm. and to China Beach, your your main deal was to stay right on the airstrip. Right there on the airstrip. I did get an, I did get an overnight in Thailand. Uh, when the storms came, and our, like I said, our planes would go to, to Taiwan or over to Thailand, and it was either called U Born or U Dorn. It was up in the northern section of Thailand. But, and that was a little, a little different. You got off the plane and you know, you were, you're free to go back wherever you want. Uh, go into town for a hotel, spend the night, get a good meal, somewhere like that. And just sort of driving through, the ho driving through town in the taxi, you see the, you know, the, a park with a large Buddha statue in it, and you're sort of like, oh, I'm a real tourist now. I'm yeah. <laughs> getting to see the world. <laughs> but just an overnight in Thailand, that was about it. Yeah. Did you ever get into Saigon at any point? No. Never went to Saigon, never, never went really, never went anywhere outside of yep. Da Nang now. The oddity was, and I don't, uh, the next time I talk to him, I'll have to ask him, uh, guy I went to high school with. I don't know how he found out I was in Da Nang or I found out he was in Da Nang, but he was in the Navy. And we met up and went to his Navy base while I was there in Da Nang. And I don't remember to this day how we each knew the other one was there. Huh. But uh, we went over, and for some reason, he was in charge of the uh, enlisted men's club, so I went over there and oh. spent the evening over there and went back to my hooch huh. the, uh, that same night. But oh. travel around there, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, there was no, no, no out in the field, no in and out, no around town. Just you were there or you were at Freedom Hill, and yeah. that was about it. Yeah. Well, would anybody like to ask any questions? Uh, I would, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. I'm curious about um, your anybody else in your family, either before you or after you had served in? My father was, uh, was in the Seabees before World War II, uh, and then when World War II broke out, he went back into the Seabees in the Navy. Uh, my older brother went to college on an NROTC scholarship, but didn't last. He injured a knee, and he was discharged out of that. Uh, other than that, so my father and I are the only ones who ever, ever served active duty. So I guess he was proud of you. Eh, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he may not have said it, but he was, I'm sure. Could be, could be, yeah. But there was no, you know, no one in the family was particularly upset or elated when I went over or came back. It was, yeah. was kind of, I guess, they were just like, they had their own lives to live. It was, yeah. but we were, we, were a, we were a small competitive group in our family when you think about it. My older brother was born January 46, I was born September 47. My sister was born October 48, and my younger brother October 49. Uh, close together. Uh, close would be. A, <laughs> there's not even a. There's not even a full year between my my sister and my younger brother. Uh, and so it was uh, it, it was a com fairly competitive environment. Yeah. To, you know, you were. Yeah. Everybody had to do everything you could. You know. Yeah. I remember from a childhood, my mother would put us all in the bathtub. And it was kind of funny. Uh, my father was not the most family-oriented, shall we say. So we were in the bathtub, and she would get us out of the bathtub. I'd go in and get your father to dry you. And then you'd hear from the living room, you hear, show me how well you can dry yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. <laughs> he taught you independence, right? Yeah, independence was there, you know. <laughs> show me how well you feed yourself, things like that. <laughs> Well, before we finish, I want to give you a chance to say anything else you want to say about your life, your military service, or just anything you would like to have permanently stored on this mm -hmm. video of your story. I think uh, a couple of things from the Marine Corps was if you dedicate yourself to something, you, know, you, you, know, you don't just sort of get as close as you can. You, you really do want to put forth your best and hold yourself to a standard uh, because no one else is going to hold you to a standard. Yeah. I mean, they, they can tell you they want it, but it's what you've got that drives you. Yeah. And that was, that was one of the things like that. And the camaraderie of there'll always be somebody beside you. There'll always be somebody who's got your back. Well, that, that, that's a wonderful message and a wonderful philosophy. And, and you've, You've obviously lived your life consistent with that philosophy. Yeah. I mean, you, you've had a fascinating life. And, uh, I mean, your military experience itself, just having two, in effect, two tours in Vietnam because of your sickness. Yeah. And uh, 
you handled that with courage because that couldn't have been easy. No, it wasn't. It was it, well, like I said, when you got when they put us on the plane there at, at Da Nang, and um, this one kid that came in, he had more tubes than he had places to put, than he had places to put tubes. You were supposed to be on quiet. That's okay. You can turn it. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, there was, I mean, there were there were guys there when you know at uh, once we got ambulatory there. Oh, shut up. <laughs> We can edit all that out. Thank you. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> I had the thing turned on the airplane. Um, once we got ambulatory there, you know, we would go to the movies at night, things like yeah. you know, the in-house movie theater. And I mean, there were there were kids there. I mean, I was older than most of those people because I'd spent two years in college before I went in. Yeah. Um, but you know, there was a guy who you know wasn't sure they they weren't sure he was going to keep his leg. You know, like I said, that one kid they put on the plane just gobs and gobs of tubes and stuff and he didn't get off the plane at, he didn't get off the plane in Manila he didn't get off the plane in Guam wow. I don't know how far he went to get off but you know sort of the casualties of war that you don't see you're on the you're on the ground at Da Nang you see planes taking off and coming in you might hear you know you, we saw a plane crash you might hear of somebody you know plane getting shot up but you didn't see what happened to people yeah. uh, seeing them get on that plane with a variety of this that and the other thing yeah. yeah, that that that's the side of war you really didn't want to see. Yeah, well, between that and your experience with the burial detail at the yeah, funerals, the burial was was probably the most. You know, it, you just I didn't know these people. I'd been injured for just a few months, and yet yeah, there I was folding the flag, tuck it in, hand it, step back, salute, and then watch them kneel and say, on behalf of a grateful nation. You'll never forget that, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming in here today. And you, I mean, you've served your country, you've served your state for many years in state government. And, uh, you know, not many people can say they've served both their country and their state the way yeah. you have. And thank you. We appreciate you coming in and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it.